All right, how are you guys doing this morning? Great. Uh, I'm excited to be here today uh, to talk about one of my favorite topics, um, which is this concept of developing a continuous feedback loop. So we'll get into what that is and why that's important. Uh, but let me start by uh, telling you um, uh, just a little bit about um, myself here, and particularly about uh, two of the recent products that I built, uh, because it'll be the backdrop of a lot of what we're going to be talking about. So uh, as Amelia mentioned, um, I'm the founder and CEO of a startup called NoteJoy. And what NoteJoy is, is it's a collaborative notes app for teams. Our whole idea is that we believe that we're kind of in a day and age now where people are overusing communication tools like email and Slack in the enterprise and underusing uh, true collaboration tools, especially document collaboration tools like docs and wikis. And the reason we believe that is, is because there's too much friction when you're using traditional document collaboration tools. The whole idea with NoChoy is to make it incredibly lightweight for you to capture and share information with your teams. So instead of when you're thinking about sending out that email, you instead look at a tool like NoChoy to capture and share information with your teams. So that's what, in a nutshell what uh, NoChoy is all about. Uh, we launched this product about six months ago uh, and have been in market um, for that amount of time. We had a nine month uh, beta period before that. And I started this uh, with my co-founder, Ada. So the team is actually just the two of us. Um, so we're kind of in the earliest stages of getting a startup off the ground and having a lot of fun doing that. This is actually my third startup. So uh, I just have a deep passion for uh, doing early stage startups. So let me contrast this um, to the product that I uh, previously built right before NoChoy. Uh, as uh, was mentioned, uh, my previous startup, Connected, was acquired by LinkedIn. And in the last two years at LinkedIn, I actually incubated a brand new business for LinkedIn called LinkedIn Sales Navigator. The idea was that LinkedIn had uh, tens of millions of sales professionals using LinkedIn free. We wanted to create a dedicated product, a premium subscription, that was really all about helping them be more successful. So we came up with this idea for a product we called LinkedIn Sales Navigator. And the thought was that at the time, you know, sales is going through this journey where cold calling is pretty much dead. No one picks up uh, their phone anymore because of the cold calls. People, frankly, don't even respond to cold emails. So there had to be a better way to keep making sales professionals productive. And our belief at LinkedIn was that you could leverage social networking, you could leverage professional networks like LinkedIn to be far more successful as a sales professional. And so what we did was build a dedicated product around that idea. How can sales professionals leverage social selling to be far more effective? Helping them identify the right prospect at the target customer they're trying to sell into. Helping them do other things like actually um, find a warm path in so they can get a warm introduction to their target prospect. And even reach out to folks using a product that we made available called LinkedIn InMails. So that was the product we built uh, at LinkedIn. Uh, was fortunate enough to luck, uh, quickly sale, scale this to a $200 million business and actually to a team of about 500 people. So it was a great opportunity for me to kind of learn to scale uh, both the business as a P&L owner, but also to build a large team. This is just a, uh, a picture of the R&D team uh, when we launched Sales Navigator uh, to the public um, after we had uh, built it. So that's just a quick uh, idea about some of the products I've built. But what I wanted to talk about today is this concept of customer centricity. We spend a lot of time wanting to be, build organizations and build products from a very customer-centric view. And when I think about that ideal, the first person that comes to mind for me is Jeff Bezos. Bezos really embodies this concept of customer centricity. Amazon has had incredible success in new product innovation, frankly more so than many businesses, um, tech businesses, um, and been able to make multiple businesses incredibly successful. Outside of scaling retail pretty much across every retail vertical, they've entered it into other businesses like Amazon Prime and obviously um, AWS and been incredibly successful. And Bezos attributes a lot of it to his customer centricity. So I'm definitely a student of uh, Bezos. Uh, there was this great book uh, called The Other Everything Store written by Brad Stone. If you haven't read it, uh, I'd encourage you to read it. Uh, I loved it. 
Uh, but I'm also love the fact that Jeff Bezos every year in his shareholder letters gives us insight into how he thinks about running the business. And I've read every shareholder letter that's been published since 1997 when they IPO'd. And uh, here's a nice gem from uh, the most recent shareholder letter. Bezos says, one thing I love about customers is that they are divinely discontent. Their expert expectations are never static. They go up. It's human nature. We didn't ascend from our hunter-gatherer days by being satisfied. People have a voracious appetite for a better way. You cannot rest on your laurels in this world. Customers won't have it. And this sort of speaks to how he thinks about how they have to constantly be innovating with the customer in mind. And so we all kind of aspire to this idea that we want to be not only customer-centric, but we want to be customer-obsessed, that we really want to be focusing on that. And you know, that's an easy ideal for us all to agree that we aspire to, but the question becomes, how do you actually achieve it? What does building a customer-centric organization and startup even look like? What are the elements of that? And so what I want to spend the bulk of the time today talking about is what I believe are some of the key elements of building a great customer-centric product and a customer-centric team and organization around it. So before I jump in, would love to hear um, some quick thoughts from you guys. Uh, what have you done in your startup uh, or some of the practices that your startup leverages to be customer-centric? User interviews. Yeah, that's great. User interviews. NPS and CSET. <laughs> Perfect. NPS and CSET. We have a tagline in Slack called We Have the Best Customers. And all the company is encouraged to post about things that they've seen our customers doing and hashtag it. Oh, I love that. Posting about what customers are doing and hashtag tagging it. We have the same thing, but also for trolls so that we know what people hate. <laughs> oh, interesting. For trolls. Yeah, that's great. Other ideas? That's great. Anything else? OK, cool. That's great. So love the ideas. And it's great to see that many teams are already leveraging customer-centric approaches uh, to be successful. So let's kind of get into uh, the framework or the way I think about cu uh, customer centricity and building with that within organizations. So to kind of borrow from this idea of um, uh, true university, kind of want to think about this in terms of academic classes. So you think about when you go to university, you got your 100 level classes, which is just getting started, your 200 level, 300 level, it's starting to get some mastery, and ultimately your 400 level class, which is, OK, we're really trying to build hardcore expertise in here. So let's kind of walk through what, uh, what that looks like uh, when you're trying to build uh, customer centricity. So 100 level, OK, this is kind of the bone dead simple stuff where uh, you know, back in the day when we used to build products, we thought maybe we just build it and then people will come. Obviously, that never works. And we have to be out there talking to customers. I think everyone knows that. That's a no brainer. So then we quickly move into this idea that um, you know, we, so, so many of us have moved away from kind of waterfall development into leveraging lean startup methodologies uh, through a lot of the thinking of thought leaders like Steve Blank and Eric Ries talking about, you know, it's really important to get out of the building and talk to your customers. And, uh, you know, I think at this point that's kind of almost uh, uh, very well understood that you need to go do that. So maybe at, when you're executing at a 200 level of customer obsession, you're talking to customers. That's great. Uh, you should definitely be doing that. So now let's talk about what being great at this starts to look like. So when you start to get really good at this, this is 300 level, what you've realized is that there is a combination of qualitative factors and influence and research that you can bring to make your products better, as well as quantitative uh, metrics that you can leverage to help understand your customers, understand your business, and be successful. And so what, what you see in companies that are doing this really well is that they are both leveraging uh, quantitative uh, analysis that typically looks like looking at dashboards at least on a weekly basis, if not on a, month, on a daily basis. And this usually spans 
categories like acquisition dashboards, um, engagement dashboards, monetization dashboards, and using that to really get insight into what's happening across the bulk of your user base. And that, those quantitative measures are really important. They usually then supplement that with well-designed research studies. This is where you're going and doing those user interviews. Um, you're doing these really well-designed user studies, often with UX researchers to help you make sure when you're designing your customer research, you're doing it without bias. Um, you're doing it in such a way that you're asking the exact same questions because you have a great interview guide. And um, that becomes really important to bringing a lot of insight into what great uh, products your customers want you to build, understanding their pain points, understanding what's working and what's not working, their motivations and whatnot. So that's great. I'd say um, the best organizations are already doing that. But specifically where I want to spend time is what I think is the next level, even above and beyond that, the 400 level of customer obsession. And really, this is about designing a system that's really a continuous feedback loop where you're constantly getting feedback from your customers. And the way I believe you can facilitate this and make this happen is through three key elements. The first is a feedback river, a feedback system of record, and deep synthesis. So we'll get into all of those in, in grave detail. But before I do, I want to talk about where I, why I think this 300 level of customer obsession where you're looking at both quantitative measures as well as doing well-designed uh, research studies why that, frankly, is not enough when you're really trying to build a customer-obsessed organization. Firstly, um, metrics are incredibly valuable, and you should be looking at them on a daily basis. Uh, but really, what metrics do for you is when you're looking at it to understand your business and your product and how your product's performing, it helps to identify the gaps, what the issues are, what is uh, actually wrong when you're seeing, for example, in a user acquisition flow, you're seeing uh, kind of gaps in terms of the user experience. But it doesn't tell you why. That why cannot ever be achieved through metrics alone. That's when you have to go and talk to that, those customers. And that's why a quantitative approach without a qualitative approach doesn't work. So that's why we always start to build these well-designed research studies. That's great, but unfortunately, what typically happens with well-designed research studies, given the process that's involved and the time that's involved, is they don't happen all that frequently because they feel like these heavyweight things that you're doing, they require a lot of team resources, that oftentimes when you think about when people do these well-designed research studies, it's usually at the beginning of a big redesign, or maybe on a quarterly basis, or a semi-annual basis, um, or when you're about to embark on a redesign for something you know that's not working. You commission these studies in a very specific ad hoc way. When you have those studies, it's great, but the challenge is you don't always have them and they quickly get out of date. And where we want to get to the point of is really trying to do what we've been able to master on the quantitative side, which is you can look at metrics every single day if you want to, and you're seeing what's happening and the pattern that's happening. You can look over week, week, uh, week over week or day over day growth rates and see what's changing. So you have this continuous quantitative way of understanding your customer. But on the qualitative side, we haven't really had that. And that's where I think getting to that next level, this 400 level of customer obsession, creates mechanics where you're getting qualitative feedback on a regular uh, daily, if not hourly basis. And so that's, uh, th that's what I want to talk about. So let's talk about um, what that 400 looks like. As I mentioned, it has each of these three elements, building and designing a feedback river, a system of record, and deep synthesis. So diving right in, um, let's talk about what a feedback river is. All right, so what is a feedback river? So a feedback river is an open channel for any team member to get continuous real-time feedback on the product across a multitude of sources. And so the idea here is we're trying to get to a point where you're hearing qualitative feedback from users every week, ideally every day, or ideally in real time. And I'll show you what we're doing at NoChoy um, to make it sort of a real-time feedback process. 
And what that enables you to do is constantly be able to plug in, get feedback, hear voice of the customer in a way that ends up being incredibly valuable when you're thinking about product decisions. So let's say you have this great um, open channel for any team member to get continuous real-time feedback. What's the benefits? So the benefits of this is that you really get voice of customer directly from the source. You know, one of the biggest frustrations I've started to see at larger organizations is they get to the point where they get these well-designed research studies, but they start to outsource it to various people on the team. Maybe it's the marketing team, maybe it's the UX research team. And then oftentimes product and design teams are simply consuming that research. Let me tell you, if you're building great products, that's a terrible way to do it. You need primary research. You need to be hearing directly that voice of the customer. You need to be sitting in those interviews, participating, drawing your own conclusions from it. That's incredibly important. When you're handed a summary report, um, it's very difficult for you to build great products. And that's the beauty of an actual uh, feedback river. You're exposing that direct voice of customer directly to the customer, uh, directly to whoever is building product within your organization in a real-time basis. So that's super helpful. The second is this real-time idea. So let's say you launch a product, and now you want feedback. You know, many of us are guilty of not doing well-designed research studies after the product's already launched. And that ends up in a world of, well, how do we do? You look at the metrics, good, but you know, how, how are people satisfied? Maybe you have some NPS surveys running. But really, it'd be great if you could just hear what people are thinking and saying on a regular basis. And so getting that real-time feedback allows you to now use qualitative research in a much more frequent way and a much more structured way. So that ends up being incredibly valuable. And third, um, you, know, you have the ability to recognize patterns across sources. One of the challenges when we're looking at feedback is oftentimes we might be looking at the customer interviews we did. Or on a different day, we're looking at the NPS survey results we did. Or analyzing a dashboard that we got from metrics. It turns out that's valuable, but when you look at them in silos, you're not really getting the opportunity to pattern match across disparate sources of customer feedback. And that pattern matching across different sources is what becomes really interesting. When you start to see a drop in NPS, and then you see some customer support tickets kind of speaking to a new issue that's coming up, now you can make those connections and patterns in a very organic way throughout uh, your, your product development process. So this is sort of theoretical about like what's the benefits of a feedback river. So I actually want to now deep dive into what the feedback river looks like for NoChoy, my current startup, but also what the feedback river looked like at Sales Navigator to really show the difference of how we're doing it in the earliest stages of a product and also how we did it at scale when our team was 500 people, when we had you know, hundreds of thousands of users on the product and 100 million in revenue. So let's look at both of those. Uh, so, uh, the way we've implemented No Choice Feedback River is actually as a Slack channel um, called Feedback, kind of an obvious name, right in Slack. And this is a feed that we can, anyone can look at at any given point and get an aggregated uh, signal on various sources of feedback. And so this is fully automated. So we have many different sources of feedback feeding into this, constantly pushing updates on new feedback from customers into this channel. So it's great because you know, Slack makes this super easy to get this on your desktop, have this on your mobile device, look back at everything that you've missed. Um, so we've really loved it as a, as a vehicle for transmitting and creating that open channel. As I'll talk about, there's many other ways to do this. You can do this through an email alias, which is the way we did it at Sales Navigator. Uh, but this has really been kind of what I found to be the best uh, version of this. Let's go through some of the very specific kinds of feedback that actually get published into this feedback river. Uh, so the first one is NPS. We use a great tool called Wootrick to actually survey our customers to present the NPS survey question. As most of you know, uh, NPS is a very simple survey asking users, how likely are you to recommend uh, this product to a colleague? And you're asked to rate it from 0 to 9. And after that, you're, you're given another simple question, which is, why did you give uh, NoChoy that rating? And it's an open text box to provide that feedback. And so what we do at NoChoy is on the 14th day 
um, or whatever day after that you log back into Nochoy, in product you get a prompt that asks you that question. It's a pop-up dialog that asks you, what do you rate it and why did you give it that rating? And so this is constantly happening as every user cohort gets to day 14 plus. Uh, they're presented um, with this NPS survey. And those NPS survey results are directly fed into the feedback river in real time. So we're getting their NPS score here. Here's an example that I pulled uh, yesterday. Uh, someone gave us an NPS rating of 10. And the score is useful, but more important is the verbatims, the commentary that they tell you on why. And in this case, they're saying, I love the integration with Trello. Incredibly valuable feedback for us. We just launched the integration with Trello recently. Frankly, we don't have enough data points yet to look at metric analysis to really see whether this thing is working. But now we're getting lightweight feedback directly from our customer. Hey, they seem to be enjoying it. And uh, that's one example of kind of the kind of content that's feeding into our feedback river. Another one is our canceled account reason. So within Nochoy, uh, if you cancel an account, before you're allowed to cancel the account, we give you a little text box that asks you, why did you cancel? Every user is required to fill this out. And actually, as you'd expect, many times you get garbage. People just tell you no reason, or they just write, type ASDF. Uh, but sometimes you get some gems, where they're actually telling you why they decided to cancel. And so in this case, they're saying, not doing what I thought it would do in Slack. We have a Slack integration as well. And so they clearly had some you know, issue with the way our Slack integration worked. What's exciting about this is that these feedback river elements not only become opportunities for us to learn, but actually become real-time opportunities for us to engage with our customer. So many times when we see this in real time, um, we actually just get back in touch with the customer. So in this case, we actually contacted the customer. And we asked them, hey, you know, you know, we have the Slack integration. We saw that you weren't happy with it. What were you expecting it to do? And it turned out they were expecting us to take kind of the entire notes interface that we build within Notejoy, embed it directly into Slack. We had to tell them Slack APIs don't really allow you to do that yet. Um, but when they do, we'll certainly make that happen. Uh, but it was a great conversation to really understand what customers wanted. And because we did that near real time, frankly, even though they canceled, you'd think they have no reason to talk to us, they came back and gave us some really valuable additional feedback. We've had cases where we recovered a user the other day where they said that the Trello integration wasn't working for them. They canceled. We got in contact with them. It turned out they, um, some bug that we could fix for them, and, and they were back in. So these end up being great opportunities to learn, but also a great opportunity to engage with your customer. You know, we also have this prominent feedback button within Nochoy uh, that at any point you can press it, and you can just say whatever you want. We encourage people to do it. Here we're getting some feedback about some bug in the product. Um, so that ends up being another kind of way for us to get feedback, and again, a way to engage with our customers, see what their issues are directly based on uh, being in product. So let's talk about a few other elements of our feedback river. Um, we built something that we call our feature request tracker, um, which I'll get into when I talk to you about the um, system, our feedback system of record. But anytime anyone upvotes a feature, that comes directly into our feedback river. So we're getting real-time insights about what do customers want. And it turns out when you make it easier for people to just upvote on something as opposed to like having to send you a contact us form and give you feedback, you get way more signals. Like it's been amazing how much more feedback we've gotten from going from a kind of just an open text box, send us feedback, to now having a structured way for people to give us feedback and participate almost as a community in where they'd love to see our product go. You know, for example, we even have things like feature request comments. In that tracker, you can not only vote, but you can leave a comment. And this is a comment from a user talking about uh, their, they want a feature called tags within Nochoy to allow you to easily tag. And they're describing some of the ways that we can go implement it. Incredibly useful feedback for us, but all of that's uh, going directly into the feedback river. Here's an interesting one that we find pretty valuable, um, which is the help search queries. So one of the things we all aspire to do when we're building our products is to build products that don't need documentation. And that should definitely always be goal number one. And we want to get there. But it turns out we don't always get there. And so when you don't get there, you want to make sure you have an incredible experience for people to self-serve and understand how to use your product more deeply. And so one of the ways we've been judicious about building that is by piping every search query that someone executes within NoChoice Help Center into the Feedback River. 
So this is view only. What they're probably looking for is uh, we have this ability to make it so that uh, you can set permissions so that notes are view only. So people can comment and view, but not edit uh, or, or so on. So they're probably looking for that. And so what we do with this is that one of us on the team always goes and executes that query against our search results, our help center, and makes sure we are happy with the quality of the results. That the ranking of the content that's most likely relevant shows up high. There's, in fact, a page that explains this. And we've done this for every search query that's happened within NoteJoy. And usually within about 48 to 72 hours, if there's a gap, we've created content. So then the next time someone searches for that search term, um, there's now great content for them to find. And, and what we've realized is that um, we're kind of in this amazing age right now where um, we, I think most of us kind of growing up in this new generation get this. Like, you don't want to talk on the phone to a vendor. You'd rather be able to like go to open table, you know, sign up for that reservation for that dinner tonight, as opposed to have to call them up, you know, have them get your time wrong and whatnot. And what happens with SaaS software, it's very much the same way. You know, even though we make it incredibly easy for someone to send us a message with a single button and then we respond usually within a few hours of someone sending us feedback, people don't do it. People want to self-serve. And so we want to give them the opportunities to get the help they need without ever talking to us. Um, and, and this is one of the ways that we make that happen. It's also been a great way for us to find out about areas of confusion in the product. And actually, you know, one of the things we ended up doing was sort of simplifying some of our permissions because people were getting confused about how do I share, how do I you know, set these various permissions. And part of the insight of us determining, OK, this is really a problem, is this feedback river. And what ends up being helpful with this kind of thing is maybe one customer told us um, in person in a customer interview that they found our permissions confusing. Well, it's just one anecdote. Like, are you going to go and like, change your whole roadmap based on one anecdote? No, you're looking for additional signals. This feedback river ends up giving us multiple additional signals for like, oh, wait, OK, now people are searching for this search term. A bunch of people are sending us contact us forms about this thing. And it's helping us build our intuition and our conviction, OK, maybe this is a real problem. Maybe we need to go double down and spend more time on it. Um, and that's where that ends up being valuable. We also pump all the Twitter mentions, mentioning our NoJoy app alias into this. So we can see what's the buzz around what's happening um, around NoJoy. In this case, my co-founder had um, participated in an interview talking about the state of email. And uh, they had mentioned us in there. Um, but this is, again, really useful to kind of hear what the buzz on what's going on. Um, we also have a contact us form on the logged out website. So before you get into the app, uh, and, and usually people use this when they're evaluating whether they want to um, you know, start using NoJoy or pay, have questions about our paid plan, and that also pumps into here. The thing I'll mention is that this is not the only place where all of this goes. So for example, the contact us and uh, feedback submissions, we still have a more workflow style ticketing system to actually handle that. And that's still important to facilitate your workflow. Um, but this is exposing it to everyone else on the team. And regardless of whether you're the guy handling that support ticket, you're getting feedback on what the customer is saying. Uh, some of these things, like help search queries, that doesn't exist anywhere else. That's just here. But most of them, we have other dashboards, like the NPS dashboard, that gives you sort of all the NPS scores and what's going on. This just becomes another way to enable people to quickly get access. And the goal here is to create that stream that allows you to plug in anytime you want. We're all used to doing this with Instagram and Facebook, where you know you got two minutes to kill, go check out what's going on with your friends. Um, now I open up our feedback river and check out what's going on with our users. And at any moment, you know, I'm kind of twitchy about it. At this, probably right after this talk, I'm going to open up our feedback river, see what new NPS scores we got, what new search queries we got, what questions people are asking. It gets addictive. But it, that's what you want. You want to be feeling as if you're hungry for customer feedback and you're getting it as frequently as possible. So this talks about how we built a feedback river um, at NoChoy. But you know, what's interesting about this, this is great when the team is two people. This is great when you know, it turns out like we only have you know, so much feedback coming in. It doesn't scale when you get to a larger organization. And so that's why I thought it was important to share uh, the different approach we used at LinkedIn at a much larger scale with hundreds of thousands of users, huge revenue base, and a team of 500 people. 
So what we did at Sales Navigator um, was uh, our approach here, uh, we were an Outlook shop. So we created a distribution list called Lighthouse Feedback. Um, the code name for uh, Sales Navigator when, when it was in development was Lighthouse, so hence the, um, the alias. And we encourage lots of different sources of information to be sent into this, very similar to the NoChoy uh, Feedback River. But it took a different form. So for example, uh, we ran a monthly NPS survey uh, for LinkedIn, not a continuous one, but a monthly one. And frankly, you know, putting thousands of NPS survey results uh, into the Feedback River wouldn't be scalable. So instead what happens is the summary report actually gets sent in here with links to all of the, with a summary of like, here's some of the most interesting verbatims that our marketing team puts together, but then a deep dive that you can click into to get all of that data. We had regular customer survey results that we were running. And again, this would often be a summary with deep click through into more information and more data there. Um, similarly for our UX interview notes. Um, we wouldn't have every customer service ticket pushed into here, because that's not scalable and that's not very useful. Instead, we had a lead on our customer support team every week go in and put the top 10 customer uh, service issues that have been reported for our product. And so that was sort of a way that we made this scalable, because there's no way that anyone would read it if every ticket was in here. But now at least you're still hearing on a weekly basis all the top 10 issues that are coming in. And you know, it, it sort of is actually helpful when this becomes a broken record, that every single week the exact same issue is number one. Makes you feel like you might want to do something about that. And getting beat over the head with that is exactly what you want to be hearing, because it's, it's kind of bringing that voice of the customer into the room every single day. Um, we even had our summary weekly metrics dashboards push into here, just a link, uh, but with some high level uh, feedback just to encourage people to check it out. Um, but what was also interesting is we encouraged anyone that had uh, feedback on the product within the company to just email that alias. And what was even more interesting was we had the sales team share their stories on it. So Sales Navigator was a product sold through a direct sales team. We had about 400 direct sales folks selling it um, to small businesses and enterprises. And we encouraged them, anytime they had an interesting customer insight, a very interesting customer success story, just send it on the Lighthouse Feedback alias. Everyone would love to hear about that and what people are loving, what they're hating, what kind of issues they have. And so actually, we actually ultimately made this the primary source for questions that the sales team had. Because if the sales team is having questions, you've got to imagine your customers are too. And so this was a sort of lower volume way where we were able to sort of focus on questions from the 400 salespeople and really use that as a proxy for the kind of challenges that our customers were going to have. And had that pump in here. Um, again, we couldn't have every tweet about LinkedIn and Sales Navigator pop in here. That would not be scalable. Uh, but we had a PR team that was sending summaries on the most interesting things and some of those analyses in here. And so this kind of shows how we made that process a bit more scalable uh, than what we were previously doing uh, at NoJoy. OK, cool. So we talked about a feedback river. And I hope you can now appreciate why getting some of that real-time feedback could be helpful to you and your team. But independent of that, we think it's really important to have a feedback system of record. So what's that? A feedback system record is a single source of truth for consolidated and aggregated feedback across a multitude of sources. It's the CRM of your feedback. The reason having this ends up being super helpful is that we actually believe when you have this and you stand this up and you have a systematic process around it, it actually speeds up processing of feedback. And, and that's really important here because what we find is that you kind of end up in this world where you might hear a piece of feedback, you kind of are listening to it in a silo, you're not, you're not sure what to do with it, and it's just not the right time to really process it. So put it in the feedback system of record, do it in a scalable way, and then revisit it and decide how you're going to action it. Once you have this, this becomes incredibly valuable for incorporation in your roadmap. And finally, it avoids this feedback recency bias that oftentimes when you're in the roadmap planning meeting, you're, you're kind of focused on the things you heard yesterday or the last week, when actually your more burning issue might have been something from a couple of months ago. And having this feedback system of record is really helpful. So let me show you how we do that at, LinkedIn, at uh, NoChoy. As I mentioned, uh, we actually built a homebrew product that's actually customer facing that allows any customer to go to this uh, page. It's nochoy.com slash feature requests. And we promote it uh, throughout the product. When you, when you go to feedback, 
um, to send us feedback. We mentioned this. When you go to our contact us, we mentioned this. We've emailed this out to all of our users. And it sort of just gives you a way to share and vote on your favorite feature requests. So you can come here. You can upvote anything that's interesting. Um, you can even drill in. You'll see some details about it. You can add a comment if you have specific feedback. And you can see who else is voting on this. What's exciting about this is that this isn't just the customer facing tool, it's the internal tool. So it's the way that my co-founder and I actually, anytime someone gives us feedback, we put it into this for them. And so even if they didn't put in the feedback, we can take feedback from a variety of channels and put it there. It creates a single source of truth that's not only external but also internal um, that enables us to have one place where people are uh, kind of giving us that feedback. That ends up being incredibly helpful because we realize that people come in and upvote stuff that they weren't necessarily thinking of. But now that they see it, they're like, yeah, actually, I would really appreciate that feature. We've gotten people in to get in these comments and share additional suggestions. So this ends up being kind of one of our feedback system of records for NoChoy. That's not enough. It turns out feature requests are one kind of feedback, but they're not every kind of feedback. Actually, some of the most useful feedback is not just, hey, build this feature. It's, this isn't working for me. Um, or, I love this and this is working for me. And so with every major release, um, we'd create a document. This is actually right in NoChoy. Um, this was for our beta release. And we'd have separate sections that we were kind of cataloging everything we were hearing from our users. In this case, we've sort of sectioned it off to delighters. What are people loving about our product? Um, objections, what are people telling us the reason why they stop using our product? And usability issues. And so they didn't have a specific feature request, but they're telling us, you know, this was kind of a lame experience, or I found I had to click a lot to enable this. And so we documented that all in here as well. And so this became our second feedback uh, system or record outside of the feature request portal. Uh, so now let me talk about how we did it with Sales Navigator. At Sales Navigator, we didn't actually have an external portal. Um, instead, we just had a simple Google Sheet. And this Google Sheet was, uh, had multiple columns on it, kind of name of the feature request, uh, who was requesting it. In this case, it wasn't users, it was companies. Uh, so you know, we were kind of thinking about, we were B2B sold business. You know, if it was a top customer requesting that, that's important to know. If we have a lot of top customers requesting that, and we can discern whether they're SMBs requesting it versus enterprises. Um, and then some commentary on why they're asking for it. And so what we did is we had various stakeholders from product design, engineering, marketing, sales, and customer success come together in a weekly meeting uh, called our Lighthouse Feedback Meeting. And we'd go through the system of record. The document was updated before the meeting. Each of these stakeholders had gone in and updated it with new data that they've gotten. We had a customer success rep, uh, service representative that came in and updated it with the top 10 issues and included the counts on those and which customers were facing it. Same with sales. We had a representative from sales who was collecting feedback from fellow uh, sales professionals on what issues their customers were hearing about. He'd come in and talk about that. Um, but the document would be updated beforehand, but then we'd use this meeting to decide what we're actioning. Oftentimes, the decision on a given feature will be wait and see. Let's see if more people ask for this. Sometimes it'd be a critical bug that we're like, we just got to get this into the next sprint. Uh, other times, uh, it would be, OK, let's make sure we consider this when we do our sprint planning in two weeks for incorporation into our product roadmap. And this ended up being an incredibly valuable source that when you're about to begin product planning, you have this incredible resource to take advantage of in terms of this feedback system of records. So that's how we did it at NoChoy. That's how we did it at Sales Navigator. You know, there's, there's a number of tools you can do to create your system of record. Um, not very religious about it. Most people start with a Google Sheet or Excel doc. Uh, some move it to uh, a more formal project management tool like a JIRA. Uh, Atlassian, uh, you know, Trello, Asana. Um, you know, in sales-driven organizations, I've actually seen Salesforce as a common tool uh, used. And now there's even like kind of more specific product management tools like Aha and WiseLine that kind of give you some of these capabilities built in. So those are kind of the ways you can go building out a feedback system record, which I think is equally important to this idea of having a um, feedback river. All right. So now I want to talk about the third part, um, which, is, which is probably equally one of the most important parts, which is what I call deep synthesis. So what is this? So you got your feedback river going. You got your feedback system or record going. And unfortunately, a lot of people, when they do that, they come to this conclusion, which is great. 
Now that I, uh, all I need to do, right, is go through my feedback system record, which is a stack rank list in priority order of features. I just, there's my roadmap, done. Life is good. Turns out that is a terrible way of building product. And you know, one of the things you gotta be careful of when you build that system of record, it's incredibly valuable, but it's not the way you build your roadmap. And so, um, you know, why not? What's wrong with it? So let me kind of talk about a multitude of reasons why I think this concept of deep synthesis is incredibly important and why actually as, as, as product people, you know, this isn't just a project management job. This isn't just about collecting feedback, putting it, organizing it, and implementing in stack rank order what your customer wants. Actually, there's an art to it. And that's this deep synthesis. It's this mashing together of various inputs that you're getting, priorities for the business, and then coming up with a viable roadmap. So let's talk about why that stack rank and implementing it just isn't a good idea. So one of my mentors is uh, Reid Hoffman, got a chance to work with him at uh, LinkedIn. And he's got this amazing Masters of Scale podcast, if you guys haven't heard it. Um, definitely check it out if you haven't. Uh, and, and here's one of the quotes uh, from the podcast. He talks about how users are systematically very poor at understanding what the reaction will be to new things. This was actually in an interview he was doing with Mark Zuckerberg, uh, talking about the early days of Facebook. And he's right. It just turns out that users, when you present them, I'm thinking about building this, is that what you want? They'll give you some insights, sure, uh, but they're not very precise and great at understanding what the reaction is gonna be. You know, one of the classic uh, ways that people talk about this is this Henry Ford quote. If I'd asked people what they wanted, uh, they'd ask for faster horses. I should call out, uh, it's been, many people have said that it hasn't been proven that Henry Ford has said this, uh, so I don't want to be accused of continuing the gospel, but uh, it's popularly attributed to Henry Ford. But the idea is clear, that people are used to existing technology. They're not uh, expecting to innovate. They just want what they're doing better. And so you know, this has been used by people to be dismissive of customer feedback. The important part here is that you did learn something you learned that at least they want a faster horse. So even though the right solution here, obviously the whole idea is it's the car, but you're learning that the attribute that was valuable here was speed and getting them to where they wanted to go faster. And so this is where you have to be very nuanced about interpreting the feedback. Oftentimes what you're looking for is taking that feedback, understanding the pain point that the customer is suffering, and then translating that using your team's expertise as product leaders, design leaders, to turn that into what's the right solution to the problem. So this is the nuance where you've got to hear the feedback, and then you have to interpret it uh, appropriately. You know, at the same time, one of the other common challenges is that you might be hearing feedback, and um, you know, it seems like this is exactly what your customers want, uh, but you have to be very nuanced at is this the customer you're aspiring to go after? And if so, then sure, build it. But if not, you've got to prioritize that feedback based on the target customer. So one of the challenges all startups have is just the reality of the adoption curve of software. Oftentimes, the people who are using your product at the beginning are early adopters. They're product enthusiasts. They get excited about trying new stuff. They're willing to deal with kind of the pain. And that's an incredible audience to get early on in your product because they're gonna be some of the best sources of feedback. They're gonna be putting up with all your bugs and your usability issues, and you want that. That being said, you have to be incredibly careful when you're interpreting their feedback because they might be asking for esoteric things or power user features, and you know, it turns out if your product only ever appeals to power users or early adopters, you're likely to fail. And so you have to be making sure that you're appropriately weighting feedback based on the target customer. And whether that feedback that you're hearing is from the customer that you want to recreate, you want more of this kind of customer, or if you're hearing it from some customer segment that you've decided to deprioritize. And so a lot of that is the kind of discussions we're having in that weekly feedback meeting. We're discerning, is this a feedback request from a certain type of customer, a certain industry? And that banter is useful in person, independent of just looking at what the feedback system of record would tell you to go implement. 
Um, similarly, there's this whole idea of user versus business priorities. You know, when you're running a business, you have to not only create a great product that customers love, but you have to create a business. And creating a business is sort of enabling your users to go through this entire journey of acquiring customers, activating them through onboarding so they're using your product on a regular basis, engaging deeply with your product, retaining them so they come back in the future. Um, ultimately, getting them to do more for you, either refer users that you want also to be brought into the product, ultimately probably monetize them, either directly through subscriptions or whatnot, or indirectly through advertising. And so as a business, you're thinking about all of these things. It turns out users, mostly when they're giving you feedback, it ends up being in the engage retain category. To make me happier, to get me to use the product more, here's what I need. And that's useful. Sometimes they're, you know, when you get objections on why they're not using it, then that could be sort of in the acquisition and activation category. But the reality is most customer feedback will not span the entirety of your business priorities. So it's important when you're doing roadmap planning to look at those priorities and, and you know, appropriately weight the user feedback that you're getting in the categories that they solve for, but then independently be looking at um, what it ends up being valuable for you. So to make this concrete, I wanted to talk about a couple of cases of features um, that uh, various companies have decided never to implement. So I'm gonna start with Sales Navigator. Um, so Sales Navigator is the product I worked on. And what turns out, these uh, first two features here were the number one feature and number two feature on our feedback system of record for the entire time that I was at LinkedIn. We never implemented them. And, and what it was, was obviously we're building a tool for sales professionals. And you know, they were like, hey, the, the tool I use every day in addition to LinkedIn is Salesforce, so it'd be great when I find a target prospect that I want to reach out to that I can save them to LinkedIn, uh, to Salesforce. Export their LinkedIn data into Salesforce. It would also be great if you gave me their email address so I can reach out to them. While those things would be of incredible value to the sales professional, they would significantly deteriorate the value of the LinkedIn experience for your average member. And it was, we constantly talked internally about this concept of members first. That when we're building products, even the monetization products, the reason we have such a rich corpus of data is that most of the time our efforts are spent around building a great compelling member experience. And our worry with implementing these features is that if a member knew that when they joined LinkedIn, we were sort of selling them out to sales professionals, giving their email address away, letting them export their data into Salesforce, they're not gonna come and update their LinkedIn profiles and keep it up to date. And so that's why we never implemented these features even though they were our top customer requests. And so that's an example where the strategy prevented us from actually implementing our, what our customers directly wanted, but it was the right decision uh, the entire time. Throw another example up here, uh, which is Slack. So you know, going through the Slack help docs, uh, it's fascinating. They, they clearly looked at their search uh, help center search results and also saw that everyone kept asking for this feature called Markdown. For those who are not familiar with Markdown, Markdown is a syntax that you can use um, to write rich text. Things like GitHub wiki pages uses it, for example, to help you to bold things um, and whatnot. And because it's a standardized syntax, it makes it easy for you to use any tool that supports Markdown as opposed to learning esoteric keyboard shortcuts, which kind of differ for each tool. So Slack uh, kept getting a lot of feature requests for this, and they ultimately just put this in their help center. They said, though we understand many people would love to use Markdown in Slack messages, we have no plans to support it. Our message formatting is similar to other popular services and is intended for a majority of our users who are unfamiliar with Markdown. However, we'll keep it in mind in the future. And so they are making this call where clearly they're getting a lot of feedback that this is important. And what they're deciding is that, um, hey, Markdown is sort of this esoteric thing that power users want. But when we look at our ambition and where we want to go, it's not necessarily what all the users are going to use and want. So we're deprioritizing it as a feature request. So being very thoughtful about who their target user was when deciding what to build. So, so those are some quick examples. And where I want to leave you um, is, is this idea that um, in addition to leveraging your feedback river and feedback system of record, um, I want to make no mistake that there's incredible room and it's incredibly important to have vision in this whole process as well. 
that what you want to be doing is having a vision for where your customers go, informed by customer feedback, informed from a deep understanding of their problems and where they want to go, but sometimes this vision might be in contrast to what customers are telling you to do. You know, probably a couple of the most famous examples of this include um, the Facebook news feed. The Facebook news feed, the feed that we all love and uh, need and kind of is the basis of all social media today, there was insane uproar after it was introduced. Everyone thought it was the biggest privacy violation in the world. And people hated it. And actually, there was huge forums on Facebook groups with hundreds of thousands of users, which at the time was huge for the overall audience they had, that said, stop invading our privacy, get rid of the Facebook feed. And you know, a lot of it was uh, Mark's conviction and foresight that this was the future of social media and this is where it needed to go. And so he held strong. But I have to say, it's not because he ignored the feedback, it's because he deeply understood the social psyche of people and of human nature. And he leveraged that to build a product that people didn't even know they wanted. And so you still want to have a broad-based vision when you're building out uh, kind of what you're doing. All right, so that's all I had. Um, so uh, you know, I hope that gave you an idea of how we think about feedback rivers and system of records and, and kind of deep synthesis. Uh, wanted to open it up for questions. In terms of feedback? Yeah, so this is an interesting one where, um, you know, it, it's fascinating. We have a uh, top customer of, of NoChoy that um, we're constantly emailing, asking them, hey, you know, seems like your team's using our product a lot and loving it. You know, can you? You know, share some thoughts on you know, why you like it and how you're using it, because obviously we have no idea. We'd love to know. And complete silence. We've sent like three or four of these emails in the you know, six plus months they've been using our product. Nothing. But what's been fascinating is they use all of our online tools. Like their team is hyper engaged. They have some of the highest feature votes in our feature request tracker uh, across their entire team. Uh, when they have bugs, yeah, they'll send up a, they'll send a, uh, you know, contact us form, and then we'll answer it. And we'll try to start a conversation. Um, it's one of these fascinating things that we've realized the modality that people are comfortable engaging with us completely differs. And sometimes they'd rather just use your self-serve tools. So make sure you give them ways to communicate with you and give you feedback in a self-serve way. A lot of people just hate getting on the phone. Um, and so we've actually uh, tried to use signals from our customer as an indication of their likelihood to engage. So what do I mean by that? Someone fills out an NPS survey. They write a whole paragraph in their, in their like, you know, uh, empty box. That's someone who wants to engage with you. We might actually reach out further with them and, and you know, continue that conversation. We also use opportunities when we answer their feedback um, in customer support requests to ask them how things are going and seeing if they're open to conversations. And so um, we found kind of leveraging the signal of there's some interest here in engaging with us has been far more successful. We've tried approaches where everyone gets an email from me on the seventh day after um, signing up. It's been pretty low um, response rates on that kind of stuff. So we instead focus on the other signals that we're getting. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about how you might get closer to that continuous customer feedback when you can't get it within your product. So just to make it concrete, so we're selling robots to hospitals to work alongside nurses. Mm -hmm. uh, so we obviously want to get the perspective of the nurses so it's on the ground, but you know, we're not we can't be, you know, getting NPS surveys from them. So, I, you know, curious what your thoughts are on ways of kind of creating that. Yeah. So, great question. So, you know, we we spent a lot of time thinking about these kind of challenges with Sales Navigator, um, where you know we had a lot of enterprise customers using our product, and what was fascinating about it was, um, you know, when you're building enterprise products, you have two sort of customers. One's the end user that's using the product, and then there's the decision maker buying the product, and oftentimes they're completely different. And actually what we found was that users, since they're living in the product, would click on those buttons that say give us feedback. The decision maker um, frankly doesn't use the product. 
you know, he's a like VP of sales. He's not in there prospecting, but we wanted his feedback on a regular basis because we want to hear what he's feeling from the customers. And so we had to systematize a process of feedback where it used to be ad hoc. We do it at the beginning of the process. And so we ultimately got to the point where we had someone on our team who had a job of making sure we were at least doing a call every week with the customer. And so we had a marketing manager who basically just created a pipeline of calls and set this up where every week, and frankly what we did was, um, we had two-fold ways of doing this. One was kind of reaching out to see how happy our customers were. But then what they stood up for us is a weekly feedback session with usually about five sales professionals um, from across our user base that were willing to chat with us and we wanted to get their feedback on something. And what was amazing about it was it was all scheduled on the calendar and she didn't know what we were going to present every week. Our product team, frankly, didn't have this planned out. We just decided the prior week, okay, we have sale, five sales professionals who are coming in here. What do we want to show them? What do we want to get feedback from them on? Um, so we had that opportunity and we discussed that every week and we're like, actually, this is the most important project we're working on, so let's make sure we use it in that time. But by setting up the systematic uh, system, um, it took a lot of work to set up that schedule and make it happen, but it ensured that we always were getting feedback on a regular basis, even though it was the more kind of traditional way of doing it. Interested in your thoughts on what happens when and if rumors crash into each other. So you get five users who love the Trello integration and five users who hate the Trello integration. Do you wait and continue to build metrics and see where it goes? Do you reach back out to those customers <coughs> and see if they'll give you some more? Has that not happened? Yeah, no, no, so that certainly happens all the time. And, and I think what we usually find is that um, for most of our features, the end conclusion ends up being it's a customer segmentation um, uh, thing where the reason there's a set of users loving it, it's because they're a specific customer segment that has a specific use case. Um, so for example, like, like in, in this case of the case, we have a, people who rave about our Trello integration. And you know, they're not even like big teams. And so one of the popular use cases for Trello is content marketers use it to manage a board of all their content that they plan on writing, the blog posts they plan on writing, and they schedule it out. And so what we found was they loved about Nochoy is they authored all their blog posts in Nochoy, but now those notes are attached directly into the cards on Trello. And you know, it's all in sync in real time, and they love it. And so what we've realized is that we had a couple people tell us they love it, but we had to get to the point where we understood what they were using it for. Um, and now we actually are writing a guide on how to use Nochoy and Trello to, for content marketers and like selling it as a use case. And so oftentimes when you unpack that, most often it turns out there's a customer segment that's loving it and a customer segment that's not. We have had one case uh, with Nochoy where it turns out it's just a personal preference which is the UI. And it's actually, um, you know, we, we use this kind of, uh, what we thought was super sexy, red bullets. Some people love our styling. Other people are like, you know, it's not for me. And so ultimately the solution there is gonna be create themes so then you can theme the entire experience to whatever you want. Um, but we try not to jump to the conclusion of people just have different preferences because usually it's a customer segmentation issue. Yeah. Um, so I also really enjoyed the talk. I think a lot of, uh, companies and uh, CEOs, they talk a lot about customer centricity, but you don't see a lot of strategy put around it, right? Mm. So I love the practical nature of this. But what I find is like, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of talk about it. And usually the CEO or the leaders are very, very customer centric. How do you as a leader, and I'm, I'm trying to think about your, your early reference to Jeff Bezos. I'm like, you know, I don't know how much time he has these days to be listening to feedback reverse and things like that. Maybe he does, right? Maybe yeah. I'm wrong. But how do you build it into the DNA of your organization in the early in the early stages? Especially now, I think with no joy, it's it's early, right? So yeah. How do you do that? What are the practices? How do you build that into the culture? Yeah, you know, it's one of these fascinating things where um, Bezos has a very specific tactic. Um, early on, he made his email address clear to everyone, anyone, and it was publicly available. And actually, still today, he gets a lot of people complaining directly to him in email. Um, and and he, he's famous for the question mark email. He reads these all the time. He forwards them on to a certain person in his team with a question mark. We're like, basically that means what the hell is going on here? Uh, the team then scrambles to go solve for it, but he's listening to feedback on a daily basis. What was fascinating is I um, just saw um, the founder and CEO of Ring um, describe how he was inspired by that. And so he put his email address on the box 
of the Ring product, uh, which is this you know, fancy uh, doorbell. And he still, to this day, gets a ton of email. The email is also all forwarded to a customer support system, but it's one of the ways that he's tried to kind of stay in the loop. And so I think it becomes important uh, to do that. And Bezos is also famous for when he has these um, kind of reviews he does with his team, oftentimes he gets slides and analyses and TAM analyses and stuff. Uh, but he asks very specifically, what's the customer saying? He's like, show me some quotes. Like, show me, bring those to life for me. And you're kind of required to do so. So I think kind of constantly asking to make sure that people are getting real life feedback ends up being a way to scale that. All right, last question here. Um, so why do you need both uh, feedback river and the system of record? Is it for different audiences? Or? Yeah, it's a great question. And so part of what it is is that if I, as a product leader, all I have is the feedback system of record, I'm seeing this is the number one prioritized thing, this is the number two prioritized thing, I'm not getting enough voice of the customer to really understand what's going around that, and then I might blindly just implement in priority order. So the elements that the Feedback River are giving me are details like, hey, when they said that, here's some context of what else was going on. Maybe here's a bit about the customer segmentation of who's requesting it. Maybe I can take what I'm hearing from uh, customer service and tie it what I'm seeing with NPS survey results, and it's, if you want that raw data to come in, go through your head and develop intuition so you can come to the conclusion that's right, because oftentimes it's not simply implementing the feature that the user request wanted, which is too easy to do when all you have is a feedback system of record. And what I find is that systematic thinkers jump to the feedback system of record before they jump to the feedback river. And so that's why I think it's important to have both. All right, great. So uh, thank you, guys. Um, if you enjoy this presentation, um, thank you. Uh, shameless plug, uh, I blog on sachinreiki.com. I've written over 100 essays on product management. So if you enjoyed this, uh, go check out. There's lots more stuff there, uh, videos, talks, podcasts, all that good stuff. Um, and please check out nochoy.com. Um, we're, you know, we're early stage startup. We're looking for feedback. I'd love to hear from all of you. I'd love for it to show up in my feedback river. So um, definitely check out the product. Thanks, guys. <laughs>